Okay. Great. Hey everybody, my name is John Schneck. I am a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, Providence is broad, uh, broad Island's the east side. Uh, I was just I was asked to sit here and to go over a few things to talk about uh, how mental health and being an author and the benefits of being an author and how you can use this to, to manage your public health. And of course, I don't need to tell anybody that we're coming hopefully out of the pandemic. Um, I saw a comedian the other day that was actually pretty funny. He, he summed it up like this. It's like, it's like you guys sort of felt like it's like you see something and you're laughing, you're like, <laughs> that's it. Well, I can't believe it. And then afterwards, like this immediate feeling of <laughs> that's just like this back and forth sensation the entire time. Hey, I have this new idea for Anyhow. That's what we're coming out of. That's what we're just trying to address today. We've got a couple of questions to help guide that. But I just wanted to pass along um, Heather, and we got Deb up here, and I'll just let them self introduce. Uh, I'm Heather. Um, is my voice carrying okay? Maybe a little bit louder. Okay, I'll come over to the mic. <laughs> I know, I don't want to block. I don't want to do that. Um, my name is Heather, and I'm Heather Rigby, and I'm an author, art teacher, and a artist and uh, I taught in the public and private sector for about 22 years now. Um, I'm in the process of opening my own school of, for art and writing, a very small school for ages 5 to 105. My goal is to make better humans through the arts um, and I wrote a trilogy that takes place where I live in Texas Village and it's a historical thriller with mermaids and Evil mermaids and a lot of folklore from around uh, the world, different merfolk folklore, and uh, that's about it. Well, my name is Debbie, Debbie Kamen, Tilly Hast, and I am a former teacher, retired now. Uh, I, do, I have two books. One is a memoir about growing up on Prudence Island called Fairy Home, and the other is a novel about a woman's discovery of herself after a painful divorce. So it's kind of a journey and it takes place in various places in Baltimore, Pensacola, and in Maine. And I have a degree in nutrition too, so I'm at the stage of being healthy to help the brain. Yeah. I have one more thing to help the cut, and you can kind of put it back in place. So. This is part of the Rhode Island's uh, Authors Expo, so if you're not familiar with that, you should definitely check that out here. <laughs> I'll make sure we put that in. <laughs> and um, I really invite you all, if you're watching this for the first time or you're becoming, want to become an author, that you go and check this out. It's been pretty useful for me. I love both of you guys. I have no idea I have a community to belong to, and I think that that also helps quite a bit as well. Anything else you guys want to add? So I don't think I mentioned it before, but the name of my book was actually Team, it's called Team Positive, How to Build Support for Somebody Dealing with Chronic Illness. And I think that's probably why this, that was a lot of, a lot of, I think that, that was partly why I was asked to, well, when I presented this, I think I ended up being kind of the lead on this. So this means nothing that I'm actually the, I have the biggest mouth. So, uh, with that all being said, I had some few questions that were generated ahead of time. Some of the people that are on my Patreon page, some of them talking to other authors, and I just wanted to throw this out there, and I'm just going to bounce. I'll start with the question, bounce it up to you guys, and then I'll, I'll kind of back, back, back up the question. So, the first one was, are there certain lifestyle habits, such as diet, sleep, and exercise, which may enhance my writing? say yes, they're all important because they all keep you healthy. If you don't sleep, um, it's hard to focus on anything because your mind is kind of wandering around. If you don't get enough exercise, you don't sleep as well. If you don't eat well, you often don't sleep as well. And it's kind of a chain reaction you can, can get into a cycle of eating poorly, not sleeping, not having enough energy to exercise, not having enough energy all those things work together. I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I've struggled with my own mental health over the years and trying to 
keeping together um, and find balance. And I think that um, my nickname is Heather Too Much, so <laughs> mostly my husband calls me that. And I have definitely had to work on um, finding that middle ground of being creative, being mindful of my body, being mindful of my mental state, um, being forgiving of myself because I, I, I am definitely a type A overachiever and I know I am aware of that and I know that I need to like set the habits for myself. Um, I'm starting starting a new business. I have made a planner for myself because like, like I said earlier, I love binders and I love organizing things. So like I, I want to set goals, like exercise goals, writing goals, and art goals for myself. I find that that's really helpful in keeping me on track of the weeks that I don't do that. I feel I just feel off of the weeks. So when it comes from the mental health side, different things we can actually do when it comes to diet and sleep and different exercise. As you guys were talking about a moment ago, we want to make sure that we have the right the proper nutrition. If we're eating things that we're drinking too much, we're going to pay for that. For instance, I don't know if any of you know that if you do like to have, and there was a greater incident of people drinking wine and beer and alcohol, especially during the, the whole of COVID. We were locked at home, nobody else had anything better to do. But a lot of people don't realize that that will actually disrupt your sleep. So after that last drink, about three to four hours later, you will wake up. It's just the way that the chemicals so you. One chemical is suppressing cortisol. Then in the middle of sleep, you run out of that, and your body kicks back on and wakes you up. So this is why sometimes people I use alcohol to make myself fall asleep, and I'll ask them, so when did you go to bed? All oh, about one. Did you wake up about four or five? Yeah. How'd you know? I'm a Jedi. <laughs> no, actually, what it really comes down to is that you know, physiologically, that's just how we design. So we want to just keep those kinds of things in check. Sugar, uh, eating after eating lakes. And so there is some researchers that show that we did not eat to keep it light three or four hours. Cherry Cheerios. That's my food of choice. Is that real quick you go to bed? Yeah. <laughs> I just tell people to stay away from, uh, just, you want to like double down on you know, pound cake and chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> and then you go to bed. So, what they find is just about any kind of food. We, we can stay about three or four hours and I'm just giving your body time to just settle itself down. As you may have to bust a little bit with stomach ache, that would definitely disrupt your sleep. 7.4 hours of sleep is what the average person needs. And average is pushing it. So everybody is a little bit different. Nobody is the same. There's no such thing as normal when it comes to that. Some people can operate just fine on six. Some people need nine. But what the research does show is beyond nine or less than six, then it does make it more difficult to stay focused. So I think that's kind of what we're saying. Is there a particular pattern you guys try to do when it comes to going to bed? And I try to go for a bit close to the same because I have sleep issues. I do all the things they tell you. Go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, Perfect. don't drink coffee, don't eat heavily, some Cheerios, which is a little snacks. Kind of gets me through yeah. the night. Otherwise, I'm up at 2 o'clock eating Cheerios. So. But in general, just keeping it a routine. Yeah, and if you're having a hard time, like establishing this, this is what I would usually say with some of the patients that are dealing with insomnia, is go to bed. If you're lying there and you're having a hard time falling asleep, and you do that for longer than 20 minutes or half an hour, so you're doing that whole look at the clock, look at the clock, get up and go and do something. I'm not trying to do anything with the blue light. Go read. Go read a book by your favorite local author. And when you finally feel tired, go to bed. And the other big key is always get up at the same time. So pick the time, 7.30, 8 o'clock, even if you're dead tired, get up anyways. It requires a little bit of motivation, but it's something that I've actually found can help reset that. It does affect how, how we operate. Because it's uh, less than six hours over a certain amount of time, it's like being intoxicated. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm much more apt to be less than six hours than intoxicated. <laughs> it does make you not be able to function. And I usually try to stop looking at my computer at Even with the blue light protection stuff that's not there, the fact that you're still getting a bright light is really what it comes down to. I do the same. I try not to um, be on my phone or my computer an hour before I go to bed. And I find that I sleep better if I read and not watch television before I go to bed too. So I try to 
try to like get in bed and like read a book and then as I find myself getting more and more relaxed and then I have a better night's sleep and I hold that. Okay. Well, you know, almost sounds like what you're saying too is doing a practice like a mindfulness practice. Are you guys familiar with mindfulness? You've heard of that before? Um, and I don't necessarily mean mindfulness meditation because a lot of people, when I say mindfulness, they think of somebody sitting on a pad or doing some kind of busy yoga stance. But I like to think of mindfulness as situational awareness. And that's basically just sitting in space, just sitting in the place that you're in, and doing something as simple as, well, out of my book, there's something called the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 method. Five things you can see, four, three, four things you can hear, feel, three things you can smell, two things that you can. So you want to use all five senses. You can just do that a number of times before going to bed, just to try to slow things down. So all of these things, all of our lifestyle and habits, and I say habits skill, so you gotta practice it. So if you said it, I'm gonna wake up at 7.30 every day, and you don't, okay. Are you a failure? No. I mean, how many times have we have to, how many times have you have that book in it before it was written? Oh my God. too many. <laughs> right, so as an author, you guys can all relate to that too, right? You don't, you don't just write the first one and it's like perfect. Or did you, did you forget? <laughs> You're looking like you're writing. All right. Yeah. It'd be a miracle. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Pull that off. Um, now, another thing that came up was, what are some good ways that you guys have dealt with uh, dealing with thoughts of it, just repetitive thoughts, anxiety, feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm a poster, I don't belong here, and of course the the faded writer's block. So, I'm just curious, like, what are some of your guys' strategies when it comes to those? So. Uh... Over the years, I've learned to have good, positive self-talk. That's been a huge helping tipping point for me. Was like realizing like the way that I'm speaking to myself in my head and being more positive about it. And, like finding like how am I talking to myself? And when I I, t I try to impart this to my students as well. Like I see it with like a lot of young people that are like I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm this and that, and then just recognizing that that voice is always inside of your head, and then like to hear it and say, just stop, like, almost remove myself, and if I wasn't me, and I was a friend to myself, would I say these things? And the answer is no, like, I would not tell a friend, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're not enough, I would never do that, so I, I shouldn't do that to myself, so making sure, even when I was writing, listening to myself, like when I would get tired or I wasn't getting anywhere, it was like I had deadlines that I needed to meet. I had, like I said, very rigid deadlines for myself, and word counts. And if I didn't meet it, I had to be okay with, why was why didn't I meet it today? Well, I'm, you know, I'm tired, I'm not feeling well, there's a lot going on in the family, and that is okay, this is enough. And then being okay with that. Um, so really working on the self-talk, I think, is like my biggest. No, but I'm also hearing to tie back to what we were just saying a moment ago. Situational awareness. Again, you're aware not only of what's going on around not here, but we're aware of the inner dialogue. What about you? Uh, I think there are two things. One is being aware of what helps you know what makes you feel better. Sometimes it's just a matter of experience. That, you know, if you're feeling down, if you talk to a friend, you feel better. From writer's block specifically, I, for me, it's physical, doing something physical. I go for a walk, I mow the lawn, I work in the garden. There are things that free my mind, but use my body. And sometimes my mind doesn't go anywhere, it just sort of rests because it's like a, you're repeating the action, you know. Back and forth across the lawn as I know it, or pulling weeds, and it just gives your body, your body movement, and your mind rest from frantic thoughts. And sometimes it just takes off. Um, I haven't been able to write sitting in the computer, which is probably true. I go for a walk. And this, I was walking in Baltimore when the main character joined me. That's how I started writing that book. Just awesome. all of a sudden was in my head. So, so and what I did is very similar to you. I, was, I had a very strict regimen, like I'm going to give up the 
I, I'm gonna get my workout done. And I always try to put because there's research that shows if you're having a hard time like processing things, you can get up and do some type of cardiovascular activity, you get everything moving and you'll get good connections because when you're running or walking or doing something that gets that up, you, you are creating new neural endings. So you can take advantage of that. Because if your body's always trying to learn how to be more efficient when you run, balance, and kind of balance activity works with that as well. So if you're having a hard time, start the day off with that, and then when you come home, eat, and then start to write. And just like you guys said, I try not to get too attached to, I have to write. Because there were times where it's like, it's just, I can't. I was just feeling like, nah, I don't want to do this. And so what I would allow myself to do is, let's play with what the front of the book might look like. Let's, what if, what if I put, you know, this section, let's look at the sections, do the sections make sense? So it's not, not a bad idea to just do some of the, the editing as well. I would still always try to write. I would always give myself like, the first 20 minutes and just try to write. And if it didn't work, then I would shift over to something else because I'm just sitting together beating yourself up. And then going for a run, or I would call it cross training. You go and do something else that has nothing to do with that, or go take a shower. Because most of your reading moments happen when you're engaged and think about a shower. That's five, four, three, two, one exercise all over again. Right? You've got, you've got all kinds of sensory things going on attention to it and a lot of times when we do that all of a sudden the answer comes forward. And then you said stop, right? Yeah. So here's another acronym for you. S T O P. Step back or sit back or whatever it is you're doing. Take a breath or two or three. And like you said, observe what's going on. How am I reacting? What are the sensations? What am I actually trying to do right now? Is what I'm doing is what I'm doing right now work. And then P is you proceed on what matters, the personal value. It sounds like in that moment we, we need a little self-compassion, a little, a little break away, a little bit of peace for the moment. And that's what we can, we can always tack on an extra 12 minutes tomorrow, right? <laughs> Alright, so let's move on to the next one. I think it's very similar. Um, is it true that writing is type of a, is a form of mental health practice? This is a little bit out there, but I thought it was the, it's an interesting take, but I'm just curious, like when you were writing, do you view it as a way to actually you know, mental health is it good for your mental health? Definitely, I would say it is. Um, I think it's a I would write when I 
couldn't make sense of things that were happening to me. Um, and I, I don't know how I get into that practice, but I just did. And it, it always made me feel better to just write really angry and <laughs> get it all out. And it was like like just a dump of what And then I got it out, and I felt better, and I could go back and look at it when I was in a better place and kind of analyze what was going on. And then I, you know, I'd always done that. And then I, I messed around with poetry a little bit. And again, it was not anything that I ever shared with anyone or just moving words around based on a feeling, more like I looked at it from an artistic standpoint, like which way I would work with paint, or moving colors around and trying out different things, just moving words around until they felt good and they felt right. And that, again, was something from my inner piece. And then um, I was an English teacher, I was working with English teachers in the junior high school I was teaching that, and they did a writing across the curriculum. And that's how I got into writing because we had a journal for 15 minutes across the curriculum class. And then we, we could share. And it was mostly like what had happened during the day or things that were on our minds or just, and I we would share and no one wanted to go after me, <laughs> which was kind of very flattering. And I was like, oh, come on. And they were like, no, 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 you need to do this full time. And that, that gave me the courage to move on. So I, I, the writing that I did as therapy kind of morphed into my fiction writing and my journalistic writing. And that being part of, so in part of dealing with formal well, mental health practice, it sounds like you guys took this and then you, both of you, reached out afterwards and they were able to, were able to extend it out to you. So you made it not just about you, you pushed it out to the, to the world. And whether it turns into a book or not. So it also from a, from a psychological standpoint, there's something called object-subject relation. And what happens with the, the thoughts is they're abstract. You can't see them. And a lot of times we have like implicit rules that are running in the background. If I don't get this, this book done, if I don't do this, COVID really sucks in. You're just going to give into that thought, even though it's there. It's hard to see because it starts to dictate what we will do. So some, there's a thought, and it, when we have that thought, there's a sensation, or the sensation and the thought, they kind of happen simultaneously, and it pushes off in a direction. So writing things down, whether it becomes a book, whether it's just a way to vent. Um, one of the things I will do with people who've got with trauma is I have them write it out. Write out the entire story, write the story. And then I'll have them tell me the story. And I'll have them tell me it again. Tell me it again. Tell me it again. Until it doesn't have the same effect. You can't. It's, it all takes place inside of language. But we're taking it out of here where it's your subject to it. And we're turning it into an object. Something you can actually see. And then we can ask ourselves, is this useful or not? This is what I really want to play with right now. And some I think some of the best music, some of the best art put in artwork, because as you were saying, I had to just put it all out on paper. Well, as an effort, they say, I had to, I just had to write it out. It was something and I had to write it out the it's a music. Or I had to I, some of the greatest artwork was just them smearing things all over the place until they got what they were looking for. So I think it absolutely is a form of mental, it could be a mental health practice to just write journal. It's another thing a lot of people do. Um, if you find you're getting caught up on a negative thought, you can start to actually keep track of the negative thoughts. I'm a terrible author. I'm not going to be able to do this right. I can't believe that my editor ripped this book apart so much. You know, I put my whole life into this. And, and notice what emotions go along with it. So write on one column what the thought is, and then write on what the actual, and when I say emotion, I'm actually talking about physical sensations. The physical sensation that goes with the thought. Because I'll ask people sometimes, well, well, how do you feel when I feel sad? Right. That's the thought. But that's an emotion. Right. But an emotion is a label. Not the sort of way that we feel. The sensation. And that's a thought. So if you say, I feel anxious, that's a thought. So, what are the actual sensations? Tightness in the chest, hot, cold, um, shaky, fidgety. Whatever it happens to be, write those down. You'll actually start to notice the things that are actually related together as well. And then what do you do? What do you normally do? I go and I can't sleep. And I'm, this is still happening because I don't even know that that's happening. Or I eat like crazy before I go to bed. Or I have to have that drink. That's how I deal with this. And you can start to ask yourself, are the things you're using as coping useful? And this is hard to, to slowly get through some of the writing. So that, because as I was writing my book, um, my father was just recovering from cancer, 
and my wife was in the middle of we didn't know what. You know, she was we were coming out of the back of that, not sure where that was gonna go. So I had that if I didn't pay attention to that and bring it up front and center and go, yeah, there's this thing here, it's bothering me. If I tried to push that down, that also is gonna get in the way. So like with COVID, a lot of people wrote, but they also wrote themselves down. Because they're running away from they're trying to escape from COVID and not and not just accepting it or looking at this is how it is. This is what is right now. So you can, you can use coping mechanisms to escape and ultimately it causes us some problems. So I hope that that kind of wrapped it all, that uh, what the package of the, the science behind all of it. Um, oh, and then which is more important, managing your time or your energy? <laughs> and this is just people in general. What do you guys think when it comes to being an author, being a teacher, you know, doing the, the work that you do as well? That's I, I I I love this question because I don't I don't see the difference like I, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I did I, I to me they're like the same thing so I mean I, I really I try to be disciplined but I don't feel I feel that it's a challenge for me um, I always admire people I have friends that are marathon runners and I, I admire like the dedication that they put into training their bodies training their minds to do that I'm fascinated by that discipline. Um, but and I know it's important, so <laughs> but it's, I, I don't know. Wait, what do you think? What do you think? I think they're twined together. You know, I think if you don't manage your time, then you don't have time to do the things that give you energy. And if you overlook your time, deplete your energy, so you don't have balance. So it's kind of it's knowing yourself, it's knowing your body, it's knowing. So what helps you? Well, for example, it goes back to the first question about sleep. sleep. Yeah, but if you're not sleeping, then everything falls apart. So for me, exercise is a necessary part of everything. I think better, I sleep better, I eat better if I've had some exercise. But that's also true of sleep, so they kind of go together. Well, this comes up often when I'm dealing with artists and business execs or doctors or moms, and they're like, "You guys ever notice that you'll, you'll, you can go and schedule on your day? Like you can have these blocks of time to sure gonna do something, but by two, you just just ran out of time." And another way I actually like to phrase this question is, "Which is more precious, your time or your energy? Which which your most valuable resource?" And what I've actually come to over the years is that energy is actually the most precious resource. Now, you could say, well, time, time, because once time's gone, you can't get it back, and I think you can get back. But I would argue that if you're not paying attention to your energy, you will waste your time. So I, I like this question, and maybe I'm interpreting it a little bit differently, but managing your time or your energy, I would say pay attention to your energy. I mean, obviously, you want the framework and the time. But at that time, maybe you're setting 15 minutes to just go for a walk. Maybe you're taking, you write for an hour, and then you go and you, you go to the gym. Or you, you call a friend you haven't talked to in a long time. Or you make sure you're in bed on time. All of these things affect how are you going to get your energy back. Dealing with stress and COVID, um, I've talked about this a lot in my book as well, when you're dealing with cancer, or you're dealing with a chronic illness, which is ongoing, you really have to pay attention to the energy. There's many days that you wake up, and I'm sure you guys have this with COVID. Or the day you wake up and you have a cold, you think you have COVID, so you're freaking out because I might have COVID. Remember those moments? Yeah. And you're just like, you know, hyper -battling. And it goes back to the thing I said at the beginning where you're like, <laughs> right? This, this back and forth in this. So we really want to pay attention to that at every point. We're trying to keep all those things in play. Um, I do have. So any questions that you guys want to throw in there between them? Um, we, we did a couple of things that's been a little bit low, but I just want to make sure if you missed something. No? All right. So this is kind of similar. What are some ways to cope with challenging thoughts and emotions? So I think that this person is actually thinking more, was, was more focused on 
the, the frustration, there was a, that where this one came from. I'm frustrated, and I, I feel defeated. So I'm just curious, there had to be times, and I know there were times when I was writing, but there had to be times where, what, what did you do? So let's not talk about the way the theory, let's just talk about what did you do in that moment where you felt, <clears throat> I get this out of the house and I go for a walk. Just keep my brain blessed. And sometimes it means just putting the writing away for a couple of days. If you're, if you're trying to write a specific thing or if you're trying to finish a book, sometimes you just need to walk away for a little bit and then go back to it with a fresh start. If it's frustration and not being able to get to writing, I try to in 15 minutes every day and just write and not worry about what comes out. But just the process of writing often generates thoughts that wouldn't have expected. So it sort of gets you launched in the direction you want to go. Awesome. And setting the time, for some reason, it makes my brain just sit down and write, as opposed to write for 15 minutes and then you stop. Okay. So, in other words, you, you find your own balance. Don't try to take somebody else's, this is how I did it, right. and, and duplicate that completely because every, all of us are different. Yeah. And for every writer that made it big, so I always think this is funny, every writer that makes it big, and they get out there and they're telling you, this is how to do it. Well, there's a thousand other ones that did it that same way that they didn't get there. So it's just kind of like, okay, you know, you can take it, take it from what it's worth, but the hard part is figuring out how much of it's yours, right? What about you? What do you do in your uh, situation? Actually, like that's what you said, the, the 5, 4, 3, 2, the, the sensory activation. Yeah. Um, I did a writer's talk for um, middle school students um, during COVID, and it was virtual, and um, one, I don't know, I was just talking, and then you know, the poor kids, like, they're, they're on Zoom, some of them, the cameras are facing the ceiling, some of them, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't turn their camera on, and, you know, I just, I understood it, I have a 13-year-old, so I, I understand what was happening, and, you know, the teachers were like, you're being disrespectful, this, this woman came to talk to you, you really, and I was like, stop, just, they're fine, and I was like, I want you all to know, they were like, seven the graders, and like, I'm really proud of you for coming today because, I mean, seventh grade, I think, is the absolute worst time of anyone's life, and you're doing it during a pandemic, so, like, you're going to be unstoppable if you get through this, so, and you will get through this, and, um, and that's, I just said that, and then I went on with my talk, and then uh, I got a question, and they, a, a girl messaged the teacher and said, I think this person, this woman, knows stuff about taking care of your mental health. Can you ask her how she does it? And I was like, okay. I'm like, I don't know if I'm the best person for this. I'm definitely not a trained person. But I said, the best thing that you can do um, is to have a solo dance party. <laughs> and to just shut your door and put your favorite music on really, really loud. That's what you do. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I sing and I dance and I, I just... I mean, I don't even care anymore. I was watching it. I, I, it doesn't matter. Like, my, my family now just walks through and is like, then mom like just being nuts but like and like now i realize like what you were saying that five words because it's a sensory thing like i'm hearing the music i'm singing i'm moving there's movement and i always feel better afterwards so i think that's why that's awesome yeah. <laughs> and so the way i would label that from a clinician standpoint is being present sometimes all i will do similar is i just push away and just go uh oh, here's that thing i do there's like that critic thought in my head that that critic that's always there. But the thing about the critic is that if I did what the critic said, the critic would criticize that anyways. Like if, I'm, if I'm, let's just say let's use something that's a little bit more uh, kind of dry. Um, I'm gonna have to write an hour. So the critic would be all over me if I didn't write for an hour. You didn't write, you said you were gonna write for an hour, you didn't do it. But if I went over, that same voice would be like, you just wasted five more minutes, you went over by five, you have other things you have to do. Why did you do that? Yeah. That was a total waste of an hour today. You didn't write anything good. That's, you can't work with the critic. You can't use that as a motivator to try to make do what we do tomorrow better. But I can go, this is real simple. Thanks, Mike. We're cool. It's good. 
So if you guys don't mind, we got we got a few minutes here. I just want to give you something else to think about when it comes to another little exercise. You guys up for that? Yes. All right. So take a thought that you guys have, a thought which comes up for you all the time, the recurring thought. It could be any of the ones that we just identified. And now imagine that it's a big giant beach ball. Guys, well, we're here in Rhode Island, so I hope you've come across the beach ball in your life at some point. So yeah, the, it's got the red stripe, it's got the yellow stripe, the blue stripe, the white in between. It's, it's this big ball. So if you took that ball and you shoved it underneath, because that's what we try to do with thoughts, right? That's what we don't want to deal with right now. If we shove it underneath the water, what happens? Pops right back up. And if we push that ball down even harder, because we, for some reason we actually think if we try what we did before and it failed, well, we just will do it again. We'll just do it harder and that time it'll work. So you push the ball down even further, it's going to come up with even more force. So if you're dealing with rider's block, you keep trying to say, I don't, I, I don't want this. You keep shoving rider's block under the pool. It pops up. Now, if it's one of those particularly crappy ones, you get like the gas station store, it's got like the ridges on it, it also cuts your face. You guys ever have that experience? <laughs> but I, I ask that question all the time. Every single person always has, we should make better beach balls. <laughs> So my next question then is, if, if that's the case, pushing it under is not going to do us any good. Also, pushing it under, I'm keeping it close to me, in contact with that ball the whole time. What other options do we have? Even on the beach, you go for a swim. Right, so when, when we're in the pool, we're playing with this ball, and you can just throw the ball out of the pool. You guys have siblings? Friends? If you're, if you're by a pool and you kick the ball out because you want the ball in the pool, what typically happens? Especially if you have a sibling. They pick it up and they drill it right in your head, right? Or the wind will blow it in and now it's got like grass and, and sand and that gets all over you. So now you've got that problem in a different problem. So, no, you can't quite do that. Any, others, any other ideas what we can do with this ball in the pool? Put the ball in it now, it's deflated. And, and, the problem with that is if we're swimming around, now I think of like tangled around our foot. It's hard to get to, right? And why are we in the pool? Well, why do you guys go to a pool? Anybody want to tell me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but typically we would go to a pool to relax. Maybe maybe when you were a kid, you were trying to like figure out how far you could get. Like, so you, were, you were trying to grow. You were just curious. It's fun. Some people go just for the pure enjoyment of it. But if I'm in a pool, and I'm wrestling with the ball because I don't want it to be there. I'm not swimming. I'm not doing that thing that actually matters to me. So what do we do with this ball? Any idea of the little reason? Or, oh my gosh, is this like the, the riddle of the Sphinx? I've I, to be honest, I, I, I don't know. I, I would just... Uh, I would try to ignore it. <laughs> so you would just let it float there. Yeah. Exactly. So we know it's there, we notice it, the analogy. We don't quite ignore it because we can't, it's there. And every time you swim back and forth, it's going to keep bumping into you. But you can notice when that happens. I'm really frustrated. I'm behind, there's that critical voice. No, there's that critical voice. That's nice. And you just keep swimming. Because that's why we're in the pool. Right? That's why we're fighters. You're in the whiter's pool. And there's going to be, there's not just one ball in that pool, right? You've got children and other responsibilities and the critical voice and not getting this done in time. So I'd like you guys just to think about that. Just see if you can notice your beach ball. So the big thing is to just not to give up, to keep, to keep going. Yeah, and so I'm, a, I'm an active therapist as well. So part of it is um, the metaphors and the things I like to play around with is that we want to continuously move, pay attention to what actually matters to us the most. There's a reason why you guys wrote the books, or why you're writing the books, or why you want to write the book. There's something there. What is that? I wrote my book out of compassion and strength, and that's what that was underneath me. So that's the value, that's my goal. How do I swim? So yes, it's just it's noting, noting that it's there, not ignoring it, but there's that thing. And then moving on. And I really want to go back to say when you were in the, the class with these kids, 
what you did was recognize the giant ball floating in the pool. Everybody's here at school, and nobody's, they're all like, but there's this ball, the COVID ball. <laughs> and so that, it was that, that's what, it was a float. Yeah. It was like one of those big floats that we, you could keep coming up underneath it, right? And what you did, which I think was awesome, is just said, so, here's, here's what I see right now. Why don't you just take a moment and just enjoy the water? You can have to swim and you just enjoy the water. Notice the float. Oh yeah, why are we in the pool? To, to learn, to write a book. So I would just keep that in mind. It's pretty well how a story like that can actually stick in the back of your mind. Your author, just, this is what you do. You write something that people can relate to. Hopefully you change your perspective. Do you want to just, we got like uh, two more minutes, three more minutes left. Do you want to just give a quick wrap up about you know, anything else you want to toss in there about the book or story? Where am I not? Is this is this goes till 2.30 or video man? I just want to look at that. So I guess my sleep will be disrupted. <laughs> You know, she got plenty of time. Awesome. Congratulations. Um, I did. I did hit writer's block. I mean, like just a quick story. Of sure. I did it really. It's actually a funny story. So I was at um, so, no, what was it? It's a wildflower, a vegan bakery in Providence. And this was before COVID. And I was with a friend. She was working on her doctorate, and I was working on my second book. And I had all these tabs open. I was researching Vodniks, which is a Czechoslovakian water creature. And I had maps and Google Maps and stories and this video and like this rock band. And this, and this, and all this, I had everything open. And I just thought for a second, what am I doing with my life? Like I couldn't focus. Like there was just so much in front of me that I just, it was just like my brain just went, and I, I just, I started yelling. Like in the middle of a crowded coffee shop, I started yelling. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know who I think I am. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm calling And I'm like, I'm, I'm battling. And like, my friend was like, I think you need to go home. <laughs> like, How much coffee did you have? Not that much. I just lost it. Right, right. I closed the book. I closed my laptop. I'm like, I'm leaving. She was like, Okay, please go. <laughs> You've embarrassed me. Just go. And I like I wrapped everything up. I got in the car. And I called my best friend and I told her what happened. And she was like, "Give yourself permission to take two weeks off. Just you've been going hard. Just take two weeks off. Don't work on the book. You obviously hit that wall. And it was good. It was just what I needed. And I like I did. I went for walks and I like paid more attention to everything. And it, it really helped. So being mindful was like what I needed. Just at that point of like explosion. <laughs> it was my body and my mind telling me to stop. I was just one thing that I found, especially when I wrote the first book, um, which is about it's a memoir, so it's about me. The stories were there, but sometimes it's just hard to get the details. But I used to listen to the same music every time I said that.